A lot of Sox fans do not like owner Jerry Reinsdorf. Ozzy Gian Jr. gives us some insight into the man in part two of my conversation with him next on Locked on White Sox. You are Locked on White Sox, your daily Chicago White Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And hello, I'm your host, Todd Welter, a lifelong Sox fan and the site expert of Southside Showdown, part of the Fan Side of Network. You can check out my written content at SouthsideShowdown.com, and also I've covered Major League Baseball for outlets such as the Associated Press. And thanks for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel at Lockdown White Sox. Also, follow or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app today. Uh, the app today. Create an account and use code Lockdown MLB for twenty dollars off your first uh, purchase. Terms apply. Okay, again, I'm still on vacation, but before I took off for my trip, I recorded a series of interviews diving into the Sox fandom world. And the fifth part of the series is Ozzie Gian Jr. sharing some insights into owner Jerry Reinsdorf in part two of the conversation we had. Also, this was recorded before the trade deadline was completed. The 21-game losing streak, you know, was just started, all that stuff. And the firing of Pedro Grafal still had not happened. So if there's mentions of Grafal, I left it in there based on Ozzie Gian Sr. having a great viral moment, you know, last week. Uh, talking about I couldn't believe the previous general manager hired Pedro over him. Was, you know, I they've got some opinions on him. So let's jump back into my conversation with Ozzie Gian Jr. When I was on your show, and again, thank you for having me on uh, the Blackout Show, which is a great, great White Sox podcast that you do weekly with all the guys. Um, you talked about Jerry Reinsdorf and how, like, first of all, he's one of the few, when, when you look at it relatively to the other owners, he's actually spent money. But you do, you did kind of go over your relationship with him. What is Jerry Reinsdorf, the human being, like? Because he gets vilified, justly or unjustly, by this fan base. But you have an interesting insight into the uh, owner of the White Sox. Me personally, and and uh, I should say my wife and might throw my mom in there. Me personally, and my kids and my wife, we have a great relationship with, with Jerry. More of like a human human being relationship with Jerry. Um, Jerry's probably one of the few people uh, from the White Sox org. I would say Howard Pizer as well, who were at my wedding. People, you know. People know Jerry. Jerry doesn't go to a lot of weddings. <laughs> he just doesn't. Um, I think with Jerry is just a sense of respect. You know, he's always he's seen us as kids, you know, then grow up into young men. So it's always been more of like an advice. We ever have a question or anything around business or in life itself. We know we we know we can ask Jerry. I can I I can text him right now. Probably won't answer because you know, depending on the time or where he's at at the moment, but he'll answer. Uh, he'll find a way to help, but I don't talk to him about anything with the team. Never have. Uh, again, when I when I was with the White Sox, I was never in a role where I had to talk anything baseball. I was on the broadcasting side, uh, and I worked for him for the White Sox and the Bulls because I, I broadcasted for both teams. But so we keep it very separate. I never asked him about the baseball team at all. I'll go to the suite now. If I go to the stadium, I'm there, especially if I'm with my son. He, he's fond of my son. I'll say hi to him, you know, always checking, you know, seeing how he's doing health-wise. And you can see, you know, obviously you can see as a uh, – he's not happy that they're not winning. Um, but I think from the standpoint of the way that you dictate things, he just has a different style of, of running a team. You know, he's not a – you have to do this. You have to do that. Uh, even when Ozzy was there, he wasn't a guy that got into Ozzy's office and, you know, told Ozzy what to do or, or Kenny. He would come visit, say hi to the guys. And uh, one of my favorite things I would say to do with Jerry, when you get, when the times that I've gotten to do it, that you really get to see who he is. Obviously he's a great family man, but you go to dinner with him and, and there's baseball people around and you start talking baseball and trivia it, he's he's you know he's he's got a sense of humor and he knows his stuff jerry did not get to where he's at by you know and he's got his style and and we knew it when we were negotiating with uh with him for ozzy's contract when he wanted to come back you know we knew that we knew where we stood 
it was going to be very hard to convince him just because of his style and and how he sees things and how he views his general managers. But I think that he gets a, a, a bad rep because he's never been dumb about his money. It's the right word to say it. Uh, he's always been very conservative, I, sh- I would call it. He doesn't just and goes and jumps into something just because, you know, everybody else is doing it. Uh, Jerry's is, is – there's a – Jerry Ryan, so this is how this is interesting. I'm gonna say so during the World Series, I asked Jerry, I, I asked Ozzy to ask Jerry who's gonna throw the first pitch for the World Series. Obviously, it's always a big celebrity. And he said Barack Obama. And I was like, why? And he was like, because he might be the future president of the United States. And I was like, in my head, I was like, Either Jerry's a genius or I have no idea what this guy's talking about. But he just said it like so nonchalant. Again, this is way before anything was announced, which I think was awesome. Um, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know who the guy was other than this fact that I've seen him and you know that he was, I didn't know much information about him. I've seen him playing basketball a couple of times at East Bank Club, but that's he's just a different animal when it comes to things like and with me. I don't ask him about the team because I know that everyone's probably asking him about the team. And if I ask him about the team, he's going to say, go talk to Kenny, Rick, Chris, whoever, wh- whoever it is. I have a question on it. Uh, if it's something with marketing, it's Brooks Boyer. If it's something with, um, you know, with PR, Scott, if it's something with, um, you know, the foundation and the charity is it's with Christine, but it, this is something very interesting. People are going to think this wrong. Jerry Reinsdorf probably is just as proud of his championship rings as he is about the work that he has done in the non-for-profit world. That's one way to describe it. And people might take that completely wrong, but that's who he is. That's just the type of person he is. He, he has an organization success of like there's the baseball side and that's the winning and then i think that he sees the rest of the org as a success but i don't think i get really upset when people say you know when they wish death upon him because that's just wrong um it doesn't automatically change anything either you know you're not guaranteed anything and i think that when you look back as an owner the 90s were not easy because obviously they played in a time when the league was different I think every owner, I think that because of the success of 05, they chased, might have chased a little bit too long. Um, We look back in hindsight and say, maybe we could have broken it up in 07, but then fans would have been mad. You know, don't sign Pauly back. You know, rebuild. Rebuild, come back. We're probably back in in 08, 09 with the young core. But from the Aussie standpoint, Aussie's always Jerry – and Ozzy always dealt contracts directly when he was a player. Um, they've had their issues, but when Ozzy was a manager for Jerry and Kenny, there was no year that they said, we're going to rebuild. They, they went for it every single year. Regardless if it was the right roster or the wrong roster on the field, their mindset was, we're going to win. Um, so that, you have to respect that. But for my, I think he's won in the NBA. He's won in the MLB. He's extremely important to the league as a league the growth of the game. If people like him or not, I think when you've been an owner for that long, you're going to have, you know, horrible years. You have great years. Uh, unfortunately for for him, the drought um, has been a lot longer than people think that it should have been. But I think Jerry, the business human being, family guy, him and his family, I even with all the times that he's not brought Ozzy back or any of that, I still hold him in high regards, you know, he, he was a guy that believed in Ozzy as a manager. Kenny didn't go and say, oh, I'm going to interview Ozzy again. Jerry said, hey, you should interview Ozzy because he went and did his homework and asked around and um, and did what he had to do. Um, you know, Jerry has given player contracts that are sitting in a table before they go in to get surgery. You know, uh, not every owner does that. The players, that that's, they know who they are. Um so that you don't have to worry about your future when you're rehabbing. So there's there's parts, there's things, and again, the not look at look at his record in the non for profit world. He's done a lot. Um, so I think that's 
when he when it's all said and done, the legacy will be you know championships in both leagues. But I think from that standpoint, and, and again, people are the, the Hall of Fame, uh, scouting, all these different associations. He's, he's just a, he's a very well diverse man. He's been in the game a long time. But for me, I think my relationship is Jerry, owner of baseball with the White Sox. I have no relationship with. Let's talk. This guy's bad. This guy's good. This guy's. It's funny. I went up. I was there a couple weeks, probably like three weeks ago, maybe a month, and I was in the suite. I went up. And I asked him, how are you doing? And his reply was a baseball one. How do you think I'm doing? This is horrible. And I said, I'm not talking about your team. I know how your team's doing. I watch every game. I'm asking how you're doing health-wise, you know, because uh, his wife has passed away now. He's getting older, obviously, in age. So you always, you know, he looks good. In age, You know, he looked good. But he, if he answered me from a baseball standpoint, I'm not, this is horrible. And I was like, I'm not asking about the White Sox. I know how the White Sox are doing. I watch enough um, and talk to enough people to know how they're doing or not doing. But that's just my relationship with them is just very separate. I have a picture of my dad, of Ozzy and Jerry and myself. And at the time, the reason this, the picture is special is because they were they're together in the picture and they were in really bad terms. They were like in very bad terms. The, they had just been after the whole Marlin saga. And Jerry came to the wedding because of my mom, because of myself. And the picture's awesome, but like no one knows when you look at the picture, they look like they're they're like best friends. But I know exactly in the moment where they were, so it's kind of cool. I, I it's one of my favorite pictures that I have uh, from my wedding. All right, need to take a quick break here, uh, but more with Ozzy Gian Jr. takes place when we return next on Lockdown White Sox. Hey, if you're in the camp of wanting the Chicago White Sox to finish with the worst record in the modern era, then maybe you might want to check it out live. Hey, the lines of the bathroom might be short. Uh, Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer to first pitch with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest uh, price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Last minute deals save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concert, comedies, theaters, etc. Uh, you can get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. I always love to buy on the third base side, so I want to make sure I get a good view when I'm looking. Uh, the lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you uh, 110% of the difference and game time's ticket coverage. Uh, make sure your purchases cover the most flexible customer service policy in the ticket industry. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N M L B for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're chasing, uh, you're burning rubber, not cash. And with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. And thank you for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen today. For your second listen, enjoy the Lockdown MLB podcast. Host Paul Sullivan, a.k.a. Sully, is here to provide national expertise with his trademark humor to help you get ready for the MLB playoffs here in the dog days of summer. Prepare for the Fall Classic with Sully, who has it all covered with every single day on Lockdown, ML on Lockdown MLB, available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And the White Sox are off today, but start a three-game road series with Houston, uh, tomorrow, first pitch tomorrow is at 7, 10 p.m. Central. Catch every pitch of the White Sox hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search White Sox. And welcome back to Lockdown White Sox. I'm your host, Todd Welter. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel at Lockdown White Sox if you haven't done so already. And then make sure to turn on those notifications. Also, follow or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. So let's jump back into my conversation with Ozzie Gian Jr. 
Well, and the, again, the reason why I wanted to ask you the question when we talked about it on your show was it's it's, it's a unique perspective into Jerry Reinsdorf because, again, a lot of people just want to blame him for what's going on. And the only thing that I've ever said is I would just like to see him maybe spend a little bit more than on the analytics, updating the front office to be more modern, as they say, or – if he's saying like, Hey, we, uh, I want more scouts. Okay. Let, let, let's hire a lot more scouts. Let's get those scouts into high schools and all that stuff. So we can then bring in the talent and invest, you know, cut those $15 million total in checks for your, um, your rookies, you know, the, the draft picks. Okay. Let, let, let's just make sure we're drafting well and go from there. That that's been only my issue. I do think it's a little unfair when people go off on him though, because all he does is he hires the front office and really just hires one guy. And whether we disagree about Chris Getz or not, that's all he does with the team, in my opinion. Unless you've got different insight, it's not like he's, you know, sitting there being like, "We got to sign this guy." You know, no, and that, and that, I think I'll make, I'll give you an example that's very personal. Like Jerry never sat sat Kenny and Ozzy down and said, "Cut this shit out." You know, I would have, if I was the owner, I would have been like, "You two work for me, stop." You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he never did. That's just not his style. Like he'll never. He he. You said it correctly. He hires the people that think that are capable of doing the job, and for better or for worse, he's going to let them do their job. Uh the analytics thing. The White Sox have right now like a, a department that's like the the movement, the body movement. I think that they spent they they spent all this money. They have all these machines, um, in their last couple. Of years. I think they might have spent, but they might have not spent it wisely. And that's something fans don't get. I think money yeah. has been spent. I just don't think they've spent it correctly, in my opinion. Like today, they they're not lab? looking at what was that? Like a pitch lab. Like hopefully they've got a nice pitch lab, maybe. Yeah, pitch like lab. now, like I'm talking about like when then I think those are people that bring things in. I just don't think Jerry is not like other owners that say, I'm gonna go spend 40 million dollars and have no clue what this stuff does just to have it there. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, and that's just not smart doing that, but I think that they spend in the in the in the right ways. There's you can always look at a team that spends a lot in analytics and they're still horrible. I think that the people that he hired in the past might have not spent a lot of money in certain sections of where the baseball is growing. And I think the fault of his is he hired the person, so obviously he's the person that's to blame for that. And uh and then he never steps in and says, hey, what about this analytic stuff, you know, in, in general? When it comes to the 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 the, the analytical part of the game, because we were doing a lot of stuff analytically-wise, I think the minor leagues probably should be utilizing that way more than the big leagues. Mm-hmm. Um, and we keep talking about the big leagues, so that's what fans like. I, I think analytics in the big leagues is very minimal. Very minimal. To construct your roster, maybe lineup construction – matchups yeah. you're in the big leagues you're, you're developed but for the minor leagues you should be using as much for drafting developing kind of find the diamonds in the rough uh and maybe that's in that in, in that sense that's something that again he's the boss so he's gonna and you know get the he's gonna always take the blame but you know i think if they would have spent 40 million dollars i don't think they would have had a difference you know when it comes to the success or the not success that they've had. I think that they signed some guys and they, they weren't the right guys or it was the wrong time. Um, kind of a couple of things come have come together. And trust me, I think that the reason that people were moved from positions was because he had had enough because they had to be moved. And they it was something that I think in his at his age, I don't think he really wanted to do just because you're getting to have to bring a whole new staff get to know them. I know he's, he loves Kenny, so I'm sure it wasn't an easy decision. I know that he liked Rick Hahn a lot, so it wasn't an easy decision, but because of decisions that they made, you know, there was consequences. Um, and now they're in the process of, of, of being rebuilt, but he's the owner, you know, you're, you're they told you that you're going to be contending in, in three years. You kind of sit back and say, Hey, it's, uh, it's like when you have, a financial advisor and you give him money and he tells you that this is going to be the greatest stock of all times. And it could be, but you might be having a conversation in three years and saying, Hey, what, what happened to the stock? It's not very good. Uh, we kind of predicted it wrong. So 
I think from that end, I think that he's different that he won't step in and, and put his foot down and say, this is what I want to happen. He lets things develop and happen. Very rarely, I think, does he step in and say, no, we're doing this. Like, we always joke around. Harold Baines was traded like nine times. It's his favorite player of all times. If it's my favorite player, I would have told the GM, no, you're not fi- You're not trading him. You're going to sign him here for the next 20 years. The, you know, Hawk firing Tony, even though he loved him. He never stepped in and said, hey, you're not firing him. You know what I mean? Like things like that. I think that he lets people, I think he lets you fail uh, um, on your own when it comes to the baseball side. And again, when it looks for success, there's the baseball side, and but he'll he can have the counter argument and say, "Well, we're doing great in other parts of the of the team. You know, we're doing great in fundraising, we're doing great in in marketing, PR, and you know, fan experience." Um, which again might not be the case now, but for a long time it, it wasn't. White Sox fans, man, they're gonna they hate me for this, but blame the stadium, blame anything. I, I make an excuse. They don't draw well. They don't draw well. They're not Cleveland. Cleveland just broke again, all star. They've never drawn well. Even on the, the 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 amazing years of 04 was decent, like when we were there. They didn't draw that team much. 05, the 06, they drew well because they just came from winning a World Series. But they're not a team that sells out, you know, 75 home games and you have this extra cash just laying around. So I think the biggest mistake from a fan base to Jerry is. They think that because they live in Chicago that the White Sox are a big market team when they're not. The White Sox are closer to being Kansas City than they are to being the Dodgers. Yeah. And that's something that fans never get uh, and don't understand. But if everyone was perfect, you know, there would be no flaws. Um, But I think that's one of them. I think that there's more, there's a lot more good things about them than bad things. Uh, And again, we talk about owners. The guys before him didn't win. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 there was a team that threw the World Series. They got yeah. themselves banned. Because of a cheap <laughs> owner. <laughs> because We're of a cheap owner. Well, yeah. I'm just saying that. I, I think it's funny because when they talk about Bill Vac, uh, Bill Beak, I think the, the new pronunciation, all these other people, I'm like, they weren't winning. They weren't winning. He's the, he is the most – look up the wins and losses. In the 90s, again, if you don't, if you, and then the part that he gets hated on about, you know, deals, well, it's not his fault the city built him a city. You know what I mean? Like, there's things that his, his negotiation skills and what has made him great, a lot of people hate on it. Uh, but he has two franchises, you know, that, and it's hard because it's the, I think the basketball crosses over to the baseball. And the baseball crosses over to the basketball, you know, the whole Michael thing. And, you know, the, the, could they had gone and win seven. And and Jerry's a person that he doesn't talk very often because he doesn't have to. He's very sure of himself. He's a very secure. I always, I, I'll say for me personally, if I was him, I would be giving interviews on a weekly basis. Because I could probably not stand people talking about me in a negative way. He, he's very sure of himself. And I think that when you're at that level of success. You, you do that, but you got to separate the two because I can't, you know, a guy can't make a mistake. And then I go, Oh, it's Jerry. It's, it's, it's a, it's a process of the hiring and whatnot from top to bottom. And they're, again, it's very easy right now to rip on him because it's the team's probably going to the worst situation that they've had in a long time. Um, and it's ironic because it was one move. One move. And he didn't step in to say, this is the guy you have to hire. Yeah. But White Sox fans say they're going to break it down. I said, there was one move. Tony was still 81 and 81. And he went in and he interviewed. Put his yeah. ego aside. They had one move. They had two guys. And they picked one guy over the other guy. So if, if, if he was a guy that stepped in, I think that he probably would have picked the guy that won the World Series, but he let his general manager make the pick. So, and you know, for it. and you're – again, so it's – when fans say, do you want him to step in, you can't have it both ways and say, I don't want him to do anything with the team or I want him to step in when the time is right. 
Yeah. Makes sense. But appreciate your time, uh, Ozzy, and uh, hope to have you on the show again someday. Please, like anytime you want to have me, it's a pleasure. You were on our show, um, and I, you, you loved it. So anytime you need anything, well, I'm here to talk baseball and White Sox, my friend. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sorry to interrupt again, but we got to take a quick time out. We'll be back with more of my conversation with Ozzy Gian Jr. after the break. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. And unlike other apps on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. And if you're looking for promotions, Prize Picks has got you covered every week from lowering uh, select player stat projections on Tuesdays to help your lineup hit or getting your entry fees back if you have a losing lineup on Fridays. Prize Picks is available in more than 30 states across the country, including Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. I always tell you about my buddy who on the text chain who lives behind the Cheddar Curtain. He loves that Prize Picks is available to him so he can get his selections in. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code Lockdown MLB for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. That's code Lockdown MLB on Prize Picks for a deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And the only way I can get my daughter and my wife to go to a ball game is if I buy them that ice cream of the future they love so much. But sometimes they still get thirsty. And next time, I'm going to suggest Liquid IV. When taking in America's pastime, don't forget to hydrate with Liquid IV's Popsicle Firecracker flavor, a surefire summer hit. Get hydrated with electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients from the number one powdered hydration brand in America. Because baseball and summer go together like Liquid IV and indulgent hydration. I'm in Florida right now. You best believe I pack some liquid IV to make sure I'm going to stay hydrated. Blast off with the iconic summer flavor of Popsicle Firecracker, a festive blend of citrus fueled lemon lime, tart cherry, and raspberry flavors. You just tear, pour, live more. One stick plus 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. Three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drinks, eight essential vitamins and nutrients. No more thirsty summers when you indulge in hydration with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code MLB at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using code MLB at liquidiv.com. White Sox are off today, but they start a three-game road series against Houston. First pitch tomorrow is at 7, 10 p.m. Central. Catch every pitch of the White Sox hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search White Sox. Welcome back into Lockdown White Sox. I am your host, Todd Welter. Again, shout out to all my everydayers. Thank you for sticking with me this far. Hopefully, you're enjoying the uh, conversation with Ozzie Guillen Jr. You might be like, oh, look, he's defending Jerry Reinsdorf. Look, the man has a very interesting relationship with Jerry Reinsdorf. That's why I wanted to talk about to him and some of the points he made eh, you know they were fair but trust me i still want jerry to sell the team i still think the Sox have been terrible under his ownership regime i get ozzy gian jr's points you know and i have said that on previous shows but still seven postseason appearances in 43 years pretty bad but like I said, I wanted to get that insight out there. So let's jump back into my conversation with Ozzie Gian Jr. Um, how hard was it in 1997 when your dad was like, oh, because I remember it was 97, right? Because I remember it was a very, like, I remember writing a journal entry in my high school journal about it was very tough because, like, your dad was one of my first heroes. How hard was that when the Sox decided to move on from him? As a family, very, very hard. It was a reality check. I think for me, it was the moment that innocence was lost in the game of baseball. Um, and it was a very weird situation because even being super young. So Terry Bevington had been the third base coach for a long time. So we there was a relationship, um, a positive one. You know, Terry Bevington was was a cool guy, like very, very non old school when he was uh, when he was a coach. A lot of all the, all the coaches uh, with the White Sox, even when we were younger, were, were really cool. And I remember, uh, again, Ozzy and protecting his family. People think that that just happened in the 2000s. They, they don't look back. So Ozzy, Ozzy had made comments. So there was a young player by the name of Matt Lordonez in spring training. Um, and Ozzy really wanted him to make the, the team. And Ozzy had made comments. My mom was not very happy about the comments that Ozzy had made um, about 
uh, Maglio making the team. Okay. And I guess they weren't happy. And there was a pre-workout uh, before opening day. And mind you, that at the time, they had not set the rules yet. Okay. I guess we showed up to the pre-workout. And when we got to the stadium, they told, um, they said, hey, there's a new rule. You know, no kids in the clubhouse at all. Okay. And it was, okay, cool. Oz, Ozzy said, that's fine. And, he, and we stayed in the tunnel. And when they went to BP, obviously us being kids, we we thought it was a smart idea of going to left field where the bullpens are at now and, like, catching home runs. But we're, I was like, well, we need gloves. So what we thought was, okay, when they leave the clubhouse to go stretch and do all that, we'll run inside, grab the gloves, and just bail out. And that's what we did. And, you know, we ran in, ran. I didn't think, I didn't think anybody saw us uh, to this day and we're in left field. And I remember they were, they, they were down the, (laughs) this is so funny. They were down the left field line and Terry Bevington starts a meeting and you, we kind of could hear the meeting and, and the meeting was against Ozzy right away about my dad not following rules because he had kids in the clubhouse and all the players were like, there's no kids in the clubhouse. They're in left field because their team meetings going on left field. We're in the stands waiting for batting practice to start. And I remember Danny Darwin was like one of the new players. He was very upset. And again, there was a lot of players that were like, these guys are here all the time and they're not in the clubhouse or anywhere. They were they're in this. You're making a big deal. So he really wanted to point Ozzy out, which was the team captain and wrong guy. You know, people talk about leadership, wrong, wrong guy to mess with. Because he was the leader of that team. And it was just a bad, you know, it was just an awkward year from there on. You know, my dad hated Terry. So we were like, F Terry as kids, obviously. Weird tensions. We knew that Ozzy had a, we knew that his contract was up. So we knew, we were like, he'll sign. It was never a money situation for him. He'd always just re-sign somewhere. And I remember being in the car uh, and like they had these old cell phones, like um, the car phones. And I remember him being on the in the car, and I don't know why Ron Karkovice was like in the car. Must must be giving him a ride somewhere. Um, and Ozzy was like talking to my mom, and I can remember from like the conversation, it sounded like I'm not coming back. And this is like, this is like way early in the season. Like, I'm I'm talking about like maybe pre All Star break or right after the All Star break. So Ozzy knew for a while that he wasn't going to come back. So then that rest of the year was like every time we went to the stadium, it was like we knew that it was, you know, that was it. Like, you know, that was like the last time that he would be playing against this team in this stadium. And it was horrible. He was he was he was not very happy. We were devastated. We we kept our house for four years because every year he still tried to come back either to the White Sox or the Cubs. But it was just a loss of innocence. Ozzy was like, I'll, you know, rip my rip my contract, pay me the league minimum. I want to stay. And it was just the reality of, of, of the business. Ron Schuler and my family had a really good relationship uh, at the time, but it, it was just business. It was, they were, Ozzy had gotten too much power. They wanted to go to a different route. And we were devastated. We had no idea what was going to happen. So that's when I lost complete innocence. Great things happened. We went to Baltimore for a couple months and that ended up in Atlanta. But yeah, that year uh, it was, I remember Ozzy's last game with the Sox. I think it was Kansas, they were playing Kansas City, uh, and fans, you know, gave them the 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 goodbye. Um, when goodbyes were like something that were spontaneous, that they were they were not planned by um, you know by by front offices and, and marketing departments. This was just fans would go out there and say bye to players uh, because they really missed them. And there was just a lot of funny stories. It was uh, him, Doug Drayback, uh, Robin. They asked Ozzy, what's uh, Dave Martinez too? What's something you've never done? And uh, he said, I've never, I've never done the ground screw. And in one of the games, they, you know, he just did the, they did the YMCA dancing uh, with all the players. That was like, that was for Ozzy. And I remember that the last game, they all ran onto the field. They let him run onto the field first. They all wore the high socks and uh, with the red, with the red band. and yeah, it was just it was just like it was like uh it was more it felt more like his career was ending 
than than him being able to go play somewhere else. For him, I think it was like his career was ending. And he had great times afterwards, but I think when he talks about his playing days, to this day is like, you know, that's that's when it ended. And for us, it was like it was like reality check. This 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 is a business. This is what happens. This is the business that we are in. And I started hating the White Sox from that moment on. And then what was it like when he returned in 2004? Oh, we returned beforehand. Freddie Garcia shoved it up the White Sox again with Seattle. <laughs> I remember Freddie Garcia being with us and my dad telling him, throw inside on Frank. And we're like, yeah, ride him in the, ride him in the neck. He's going to be scared. Awesome. We bunt, bunt the ball on, on him. He doesn't want to defend it. Oh, we, I, we, I went to that stadium decked out in full, in full Mariners gear, rooting for 34. Like, hey, but for the White Sox fans, the Garcia relationship goes way before 05. And, and Freddie shoved it, shoved it big time. Good team, good 2000 team. Um, it was – I was very proud that we came back because – so there was a lot of things that happened in between. So, like I told you, Ozzy wanted to always come back as a player. And they never – you know, even in rebuilds, they never let him come back. Okay. So that never happened as a player. Then he starts coaching, his coaching career. And I remember remember they had like an all-century team? Yeah. He got invited for that. And he, he asked Jerry for, you know, hey, I, I want to basically ask him for, I want to come back to the White Sox. I'm going to start coaching. I want a job. And Jerry, doing Jerry, said, you got to talk to Kenny. Kenny had just been, I think, just had been named the GM. Um uh, earlier, like a little bit before, he wasn't a GM for very long. Young GM, and I remember we walked in the suite, and there's a lot of par- people. It was like a party, you know. Like, there's a lot of people in the suite, and Ozzy went up to Kenny. Um, he, they started talking, and I remember Kenny said something like, "Oh, we could start you in rookie ball or, or some assistant in minor leagues." And Ozzy looked in the dugout and said, "You know what's ma- you know what's funny, KW? K Dubs, I'm a better." coach than all the players that you all the coaches you got down there i might be a better man than you the guy you got right now mind you they had just like one and he was like oh you're not gonna you know kenny was like oh you know you're not you're not gonna pay your dues and he said you know don't worry it's okay i know you know if there's an opportunity here there's an opportunity here and he left you know like okay we'll work with the white Sox, find a job in another team and uh god's plan's perfect and um jeff torbo called him and uh, and he said, you want to come over as a player? And he said, no, I want to be a coach. Player coach? I said, nope, I want to be a coach. Coach with the Expos. And in that winter meeting from the year afterwards, we ran to Kenny. And Ozzy said, again, in very Ozzy fashion, hey, I'm in the big leagues. No minor league coaching. And he said, you're, in the, you're, you're, with, the, you're with the Washington, you're with the Nationals. Uh, at the time, was the Expos. You're like a triple-A team, you know, because they weren't very good. Well, a couple years later, they became the Marlins. And Ozzy, when they talked again, Ozzy had a ring. And Ozzy starts off the interview with Kenny very brash because, meaning like, hey, you guys want to talk to me. I, I don't want to talk to you guys. Like, I just came back from winning a championship. I will be the Marlins manager whenever Jack's stepping down. So he came in with a big chip on his shoulder of like, okay, you know, not not I'm back now. And he was very when – when he it was great being back um, – People don't realize the culture change that he created because that team had no idea what the reality was going in there. The first time we talked to the White Sox individuals, the meeting that they had, and again, I'm there listening, Ozzy's talking. They made Paul Canerco sound sound like the most evil human being in the world. They thought that he was so mad and angry and he was like the bad guy in the picture. Very quickly that we learned that Paul Canerco was not the issue. He was just mad that he was not winning. So Ozzy changed the culture, uh, you know, based on players and the way that it was supposed to be. And when, when he got there, the culture was, we're better than the Twins. It's like, Dude, you're not better than the Twins. They're just whooping on you guys every single year. And that 04 year was fun. It was a lot of re, uh, rebranding and, and, and rebuilding and retooling. And he had great coaches when he got there. He brought joy, but Don Cooper – Awesome. Greg Walker, HB came over um, with him as well. 
but it was it was from day one they started working on 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 building a winner and and putting a team together to have success. Ozzy had just done it with the with the Marlins, um, where Jack he had been a coach for two managers who basically let him run the show uh, as much as they would allow him to. So it it was it was a big it was a big moment of pride when he got to be mentioned, and, and it was a dream come true. He always wanted to be a coach with the White Sox, a manager with the White Sox. It was, you know, it was coming back home. It was like, okay, wow, I'm back in Chicago. I felt like for a long time, like, oh, I'm back in the big leagues for him, for him. You could tell that he was very proud of wearing 13 and running again, you know, and being in the field and, and with the White Sox fans. And that's uh, that, that was awesome. That was an awesome feeling. And I think that no matter what uniform he's ever going to wear or wore, I think, I think the White Sox is always going to be the most special one here in the United States just because – of what he did as a player. Uh, you know, I think when you wear that jersey and you really played to try to win, you always have that hunger. And that's, I think that when Ozzy got there, everybody that was on that team, that was the philosophy uh, moving forward uh, for everybody. But he was very proud of coming back. It was, it was awesome. He loved, he definitely loved it. All right, that wraps up this edition of Lockdown White Sox. Thank you for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen today. Now go check out the Lockdown MLB podcast. Prepare for the Fall Classic with Sully, who has it covered every single day. And you can find the link to Lockdown MLB in the description, so you don't need to search. Part of the Lockdown MLB or part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Just remember, still on vacation. Final installment of the fan series is tomorrow with Torizi and My Sox Summer of From the 108com so they discuss what it's like at Guaranteed Rate Field right now and building a fan movement. And feel free to leave comments about today's Part 2 conversation with Ozzie Gian Jr. You can leave them at the episode page on YouTube, X formerly Twitter at Todd J. Dove or at Lockdown Sox, or email me at LockdownWhiteSox at gmail.com. Have a great day. Fan series continues tomorrow. <laughs>